Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 24th Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government, supported this month by Slalom. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome you all this evening. Let's start in the traditional Data Bytes way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. Now, obviously, every data bytes is significant, but this is a particularly significant data bytes. Tonight's first speaker will be our 100th different speaker. And as regular attendees know, eight is a very significant number for us. And this event brings our third cycle of eight events to a close. In those three cycles of eight, we've tried to curate, facilitate and orchestrate presentations that encapsulate and illuminate government work on data that's great. We hope we've allowed people to deliberate and cogitate, ruminate and speculate, communicate, disseminate, demonstrate and educate, promulgate and perpetuate, prognosticate, cultivate and captivate, validate, elucidate, rejuvenate, consolidate, stimulate and innovate. We've tried not to be too inappropriate or to indoctrinate, overcomplicate, exaggerate, pontificate, manipulate, prevaricate, frustrate or discombobulate. That would be unfortunate. Let's hope Databytes continues to proliferate. Tonight we have five more articulate, consummate speakers to celebrate and appreciate. I'll truncate this introduction there so your love of Databytes doesn't turn to hate. Let's, uh, let's start with the usual virtual housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record and we are being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to get involved on social media, the hashtag is IFG Databytes, and we're live tweeting from at IFG Events. And if you want to put questions to our excellent speakers this evening, you can do so using the Slido page you're almost certainly already on. If not, go to the address on screen. Why have we done this 24 times now? Well, we want to bring together the various different data communities in and around government, speak to and beyond those communities about what better data could actually look like in practice, and put some interesting projects on the record for us all to learn from. How does it work? You're going to be treated to four presentations on data this evening. Each presentation will last for eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. I'll then put your questions to the presenters for eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes before we move on to the next presentation. These were last month's presenters. You can watch them and our other 22 previous events on the IFG website. Now, as regular viewers will know, we start data bytes with some comedy charts focusing on the political events of the last month. Unfortunately, this month brought a truly tragic statistic with the killing of Sir David Amos, Member of Parliament for South End West, the second British MP to be murdered in the last few years. Among the many tributes was an announcement that South End would become a city in honour of his long-standing campaign. This chart shows the awarding of city status in the UK since the year 1000. South End will become city number 70 by my reckoning, or rather Wikipedia's reckoning. The eagle-eyed among you may have spotted that the number of cities has fallen on a couple of occasions. None of them fell into the sea or anything like that. In the 1970s, Elgin and Perth, already contested, they'd long been royal boroughs rather than cities proper, lost that status in Scottish local government reorganisation. Perth has since been re-elevated. In the late 1990s, in the midst of English local government reorganisation, Rochester forgot to complete its paperwork and lost city status, though nobody realised until a few years later. Even a light-hearted exercise like this highlights some common data challenges. How you define things really matters. Why there being no canonical government list of cities is a problem. And why you should always read the footnotes. Speaking of data challenges, the IFG published the latest edition of its mammoth annual performance tracker with SIPFA this month, looking at hundreds of data sets to assess the state of nine different public services. It had plenty for Chancellor Rishi Sunak to think about before his budget and spending review, calling for him to allocate funds to help clear backlogs in key services like the court system. It sounds like the Chancellor may have listened, topping up spending in some key areas. As discussed in previous data bites, the budget is the only occasion where an MP can drink alcohol while addressing the House. Sunak, like other recent chancellors, stuck to water. That tends to keep the speech shorter, certainly shorter than Gladstone's fortified wine. Nonetheless, Sunak spent 722 words discussing alcohol duty and related reforms, a lot more than he spent talking about net zero and climate change. It seems he has something in common with Kermit the Frog finding it's not easy being green. Not that I'm implying the Chancellor is a Muppet. 
It is, of course, COP26 this week. We're environmentally conscious here at Databyte, so all the jokes and ideas for this introduction are 100% recycled, a line I also used at the Open Data Institute summit yesterday. I asked the IFG's Net Zero team if there was anything in particular I should highlight, and they very humbly suggested the government's new climate change statistics portal, which my colleague Jill Retter describes as good for nerds. But as well as a new nerdy data set, this month saw the return of a nerdy perennial, the Office for National Statistics annual release of baby names in the UK. There were 13,135 different names last year, plenty for the Prime Minister to choose from, with a baby on the way. Let's see how popular cabinet ministers' names were. The most popular were Oliver and George, followed by Jacob. Somewhat surprisingly, since this chart only goes back to 1996 and not 1796. They're all on the decline, which I'm sure is correlation, not causation. What about Boris? Well, not one of the most popular, but if we change the scale, we can see the prime minister may have had an influence on births with a steady increase in the number of children called Boris. Still not as many as his current cross-channel rival, Emmanuel Macron, though you can see that that is declining, unlike current UK-France tensions over fishing. Let's hope I don't have to update this chart showing wars between the two countries anytime soon, that both sides find salmon to mediate and work things trout rather than pursuing shellfish, national interests, and that the fishing dispute gives way to an entente cordiale. Turning to tonight, our first speaker this evening, our 100th of the series, will be Harry Lee from DCMS on the government consultation Data, A New Direction. He'll be followed by Selvin Brown, MBE from Bayes, and Alistair Vetch from tonight's sponsor Slalom on establishing a culture of data-led policy delivery. Then we'll hear from Burmi Ballaram from the NHSX AI Lab on the ethical questions about the use of AI in health and care being addressed by their AI ethics initiative. And last but not least will be Toby Jolly from the Cabinet Office on using automation to make government grant making more transparent. Our next data bytes will start our next cycle of eight events and end with our 100th different presentation. That's taking place on Wednesday the 1st of December. As ever, we'll be taking a break for January, but we'll be back on the very numerically pleasing 2nd of February 2022. Of course, that will only happen with the kind support of partners. We're extremely grateful to Slalom for sponsoring tonight's event. A very big thank you to them. If you'd like to follow their excellent example and sponsor a data bytes, you can get in touch with my colleague Pratesh. And if you'd like to follow the excellent example of our speakers this evening or know someone who should, please do get in touch with me. As ever, we'll be having some virtual drinks after tonight's event. These details will be back on screen again at the end. The link is bit.ly slash db24drinks, password ifgdb24. Now, we're going to try something new tonight, thanks to our sponsors, Slalom. We're going to try a poll using the polling function on Slido. And we'll try another question at the, event, at the end of the event as well. Your question to start with is, do you feel your organisation has a strong culture of being data-led? Yes, no, or sometimes. You can vote now on Slido. The question has hopefully come up automatically. But if not, you can click on the polls tab in the top right. Just think, if this goes well, I might be inspired to try a Christmas quiz next month. But don't let that put you off answering this question. Now, while you keep voting, it's time to introduce our first speaker this evening, our 100th Databyte speaker, Harry from DCMS. Harry, over to you. Thanks very much, Gavin, for the introduction, and uh, I hope you can all see my slides uh, on the screen. Uh, I'm going to give you a very short overview of the government's consultation data in new direction, which was released early in September. Uh, the consultation closes in a couple of weeks' time on the 19th of November. Uh, this consultation builds on the national data strategy, which DCMS published uh, last autumn, setting out a comprehensive vision for the way that the UK wants to make the most of the data opportunity in the future. And in particular, this consultation uh, focuses on mission two of that strategy, which is to secure a trusted and pro-growth data regime. So it puts forward a package of proposals centred around uh, the UK's data protection regime currently. Um, while that's the focal point uh, of the consultation, uh, it is relevant to other missions of the national data strategy. In places, for example, we talk about the huge opportunity of data stewardship and intermediation, which is relevant to mission one on unlocking the value of data across the economy. 
Uh, and of course, we spend quite a bit of time talking about the international transfers regime within the UK data protection regime, which is very relevant to mission five, championing the international flow of data. So while the focal point is mission two, it is relevant to, to other parts of the national data strategy. Um, and the main objective uh, of the consultation is to put forward a set of proposals that we think will deliver uh, a pro-growth, pro-innovation data protection regime in the UK that maintains the high standards of data protection that UK citizens currently enjoy. Um, and I think what we view this consultation as putting forward is a package of proposals that very much builds on uh, the, the current framework within the UK in the sense that with respect to the fundamental building blocks of the current regime, the message is one of continuity uh, rather than divergence. So with respect to the legal bases and principles uh, for data processing, processing personal data, with respect to the core data subject rights that are available to citizens, and with respect to the nuts and bolts of supervision, uh, we think, as I said, this is a message of continuity. But we think that in light of three years or so experience of implementing the EU, the EU GDPR and now the UK GDPR in this country, we can make improvements where we feel that there continues to be difficulty understanding and applying vague concepts. And there's grit in the machine of, of making sure that the, the, the regime is usable. So the vision uh, is actually anchored around the five uh, objectives that you can see on this slide. So in particular, we want to make sure that the data protection regime in the UK supports our wider ambitions to be a scientific superpower. And we put forward a number of proposals in the earlier chapters that relate to clarifying the way that data can be used for research purposes, um, uh, making clear that, for example, those provisions are available across a wide spectrum of research activities ranging from upstream research, primary research in universities, all the way through to the work undertaken in R&D departments and businesses. Uh, and we also talk about the importance of making sure that the regime applies effectively to AI systems and other cutting edge technologies. Secondly, we want to make sure that the reforms build on the high watermark of public-private collaboration uh, <clears throat> to, in the public interest, sharing data to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. There are a number of examples of successful data initiatives across the public and private sector, whether that's communications on COVID protocols uh, or shielding programs, for example. And we want to make sure that our regime makes that sort of collaboration uh, as easy as possible in the future, <clears throat> working, as I say, towards the public interest. The UK is already a, an important global hub for the free flow of personal data. And we want to make sure that the UK can continue to operate an international transfers regime for data, and in particular, an adequacy regime that is credible um, and reliable uh, and as interoperable uh, with other jurisdictions regimes as possible. Um, the concept of accountability uh, will remain absolutely central to the UK's data protection regime. Uh, and so businesses processing personal data will need to show how they comply with the high standards of privacy protections provided by the regime now and in the future. But we want to explore ways in which it is left more open on the how rather than the outcomes. So there's more flexibility to achieve high data protection outcomes uh, with perhaps less of, a, less of the paperwork of privacy. And lastly, we want to make sure that the Information Commissioner's Office, so the regulator for the privacy regime in the UK, uh, continues to be world leading uh, and develops best practices that perhaps are more uh, familiar in regulated sectors over the longer term, so uh, in utilities or financial services, for example. So those are the five uh, objectives and uh, that, are, that are really underlying the, the vision for the consultation document. Um, just to situate this in the regulatory landscape very quickly, the pink boxes show the pieces of legislation uh, to which we're proposing the bulk of our reforms. So they are the UK GDPR, the Data Protection Act 2018 in the UK, which implements uh, and complements the UK GDPR, and also the Digital Economy Act to the extent that we are making proposals that relate to data sharing between uh, public bodies. Some of the other pieces of regulation that you can see in those grey boxes are relevant, but uh, relatively peripheral to the consultation that's, that's currently open. <clears throat> Just a few other remarks by way of uh, context. We think this is very much the start uh, of an important debate uh, about the future of data protection uh, in the UK. The consultation document itself is it lies somewhere between a white and a green paper. So in some areas, we make very clear concrete proposals on which we're seeking feedback, and that's at the whiter end of the spectrum. In other areas, we're asking much more open questions uh, where we know that the debate is uh, relatively, uh, relatively new, um, or indeed the evidence base uh, requires further work. 
Um, and so overall, the, the, the sort of flavour or hue of the consultation document is minty. Uh, and we very much hope that in the greener areas uh, of the consultation, we can have um, a wide ranging debate uh, about the issues and the options for, for, for further reform. Um, we think this is very much uh, a, a, a consultation that offers a plausible interpretation uh, of the current UK regime and indeed the EU GDPR, uh, and perhaps not an interpretation uh, that is readily adopted uh, by many data controllers, uh, but we think one that deserves greater emphasis uh, in the way that the law is written uh, and also in the way that it's interpreted. And in that light, we very much hope that this is a set of reforms that we can implement uh, while maintaining the UK's adequacy status uh, with the EU, uh, which we received a little earlier uh, this year. Um, the structure of the consultation, which I won't go to in, 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 into any depth now, uh, very much reflects the, the five objectives that I set out. Those are the five titles of the chapters, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions on the contents uh, in a moment. Just to wrap up, um, the timeline for the consultation, as I mentioned, uh, it's been open for 10 weeks from the start of September, so it closes in, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, after that, we'll be uh, analysing responses very carefully over the Christmas period and into the new year, and we hope to issue a government, government response around the springtime, which will obviously uh, set out what we've heard, uh, what we think that means for our reform proposals and any legislative next steps. Um, so let me stop there. I hope that's a useful uh, overview and, and very happy to take questions. Thank you very much indeed for that overview, Harry. Um, as Harry says, we've got uh, eight minutes now for questions. We've got some great ones coming in already. Uh, so I'll go straight to those without any further ado. First question is from previous Data Bytes presenter, Miranda Sharp. Good evening to you, Miranda. She says, I think there are at least three government publications open at present relating to data. Where do they all join up? So I'm not entirely sure which, uh, which three you might have in mind. Uh, but we do, uh, we are obviously aware that there are a number of reform proposals from, from DCMS and, and the wider government uh, open now uh, in relation to data. And certainly within DCMS, we have an eye on the importance of regulatory coherence uh, across the data and digital economy landscape. Uh, initiatives like, our, like those on online harms, uh, on, uh, on competition in digital platform markets, and indeed here uh, on, on data protection do interrelate in important ways. Uh, and we're very much uh, trying to take account of those overlaps as we go about our policy work on data in your direction. Thank you. Um, the next question is from anonymous brackets, not in an Alan Moore way, close brackets. Which companies and advisors helped develop the proposals? Um, instead of open questions, uh, they think that many of the proposals look already very developed. Um, government doesn't propose changes that no business asked for. So who asked for these? Uh, and they say transparency is vital. So we, uh, we've engaged uh, with all sorts of stakeholders uh, in the process of preparing this, this, this consultation document. Um, obviously, the main opportunity to, to feedback is now uh, while the consultation is open. Um, we are open minded uh, on, on everything that we've put forwards. Uh, obviously, it's informed by prior conversations, but will be informed importantly by consultation responses uh, between now and, and, and the middle of November. Uh, and then, of course, we'll take all of those views into account uh, and, and set out our way forwards. And I think I'm right in saying the National Data Strategy Forum page may have um, some further details of some of the activity that's going on around the consultation. That's right, Gavin. Yes, we've, we've been working with um, around 25 to 30 uh, conveners who have been holding events independently. Uh, so, so thanks for that. Excellent. Um, so the next question, you touched on this already, actually, Harry. Uh, Mary Susan Barry, good evening to you, asks, is there potential for the UK to lose EU adequacy if amendments are made to the current GDPR legislation? So as I say, I, I think the package of proposals that we've put forwards um, innovate largely within the current framework. Uh, so with respect to the fundamental building blocks of the current framework, the message is one of continuity rather than change. I think it's important to realise that difference doesn't equate to divergence. So I think we have room to make changes to our domestic regime uh, without necessarily compromising our adequacy status with the EU, which we think is extremely important. Uh, and as I say, I think the reforms that we've put forward are implementable 
uh, while maintaining adequacy status. The, the, the second thing to say is that that's not a decision that is entirely or even largely uh, within our own hands. It's the Commission that makes adequacy determinations. Uh, and it will be very important for us as we take this agenda forwards to engage closely with the Commission so that we have a better understanding uh, of where the adequacy perimeter really lies in its view. And I think that's something that it is actively uh, working out in relation not only to our reforms, but uh, to other third countries where it's looking to strike or roll over adequacy assessments. Excellent. Thank you. We've got um, around four and a bit minutes left, so please do keep these excellent questions coming in. Uh, we've got a question from Anonymous, not the not Alan Moore Anonymous. Um, but they say many public services worry that if data about them is published, it will be used for ranking and performance management rather than improvement. How do you get the right balance between improvement and performance management? Um, I, and I wonder if, if that also relates to sort of how um, departments might be sharing data as a result of some of the re re proposed reforms as well. This is a, to be honest, again, that's a question slightly outside my my, my area of expertise. I'm afraid that uh, that's that's led by the cabinet office and the CDDO. Um, I I think obviously we need to be clear on the uses of data, um, and transparency can have adverse effects. I think one of the important principles that that will continue to be at the heart of the data protection regime in the UK is of is of um, of of purpose specification. Um, and, and I suppose that's relevant here, but I, I think that's slightly outside my area of expertise. Apologies. No problem at all. Um, next question is from Sam from Med Confidential. Evening to you, Sam. You mentioned that part of this would be a green paper. Uh, are you at DCMS therefore committed to a white paper on the more beige than minty aspects? And Sam wonders why this hasn't been mentioned before. So I think I, I, I think uh, this this is the uh, this is the main consultative uh, exercise that we have in mind uh, for the for future reforms to the UK data protection uh, regime. That doesn't rule out uh, realizing, particularly in the greener areas where we've started a debate, uh, that actually the debate needs needs more time and further consultation publicly to to get to the right answers. Um, but I don't think that's our that's our starting point. Really, we're we're. We, we need to wait and see what, what responses come back to the consultation before making a call on the process for the next steps. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from another anonymous or possibly the same anonymous, who knows. Um, this, is, this refers to chapter five, I think, mainly of the, the consultation. What do you think about Elizabeth Denham's comments? She is the current information commissioner um, about the impact on the information commissioner's office independence based on some of the proposals. Yeah, it's a good question, and and I, I think I was very encouraged to see that Elizabeth Denham uh, Elizabeth Denham welcomed many of the proposals that we've put forward with respect to governance changes at the ICO, uh, and also with respect to putting in place a slightly clearer framework of objectives and duties on the ICO that that, that better recognise the status of the ICO as not only a privacy regulator, but also a regulator which, through making decisions about the use of personal data, is uh, potentially having an impact on other market level outcomes in the digital economy, whether that's with respect to competition uh, or growth. I would say that the independence of the ICO remains an absolutely core principle uh, for our vision for the future of the UK's regime. I recognise that in some respects, Liz Demon felt that the proposals on the table might impinge uh, on, on the ICO's independence, and that's a view that we will take into account. But certainly, our overall objective is very much to maintain an independent regulator, which is very important for the credibility and stability of our regime. Excellent, thanks. We've got uh, about a minute left. So um, Anonymous, not in an Alan Moore way, uh, says the most definite commitment is to give data adequacy to more countries. Shouldn't that come after benefits and protections to UK citizens and not before? So, so I, I would say striking new adequacy deals with, with third countries is an important um, objective, but it's certainly not an objective that overrides our commitment to maintaining high data protection standards, not only in the UK, uh, but overseas. And actually an important aspect of our international transfers regime is that it does uh, involve the very close examination of the quality of data protection standards available in third countries before data can flow uh, to those third countries. And so while we've been set forward an ambitious program of, of striking adequacy deals, all of those deals will be made on the basis of a robust assessment of the quality of protections. Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Harry, for giving us an overview of the consultation, which is open until the 19th of November, I think.
That's correct. Yeah. Excellent. So hopefully lots of people watching uh, will be able to submit. Um, thank you to everyone for some really great questions. And Harry, thank you very much for answering them. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we will head now to our second presentation, which is Selvin and Alistair. Just before we do, I can give you an update on the live poll. Do you feel your organisation has a strong culture of being data led? So far, 50% of people say yes, 18% of people say no, and 33% of people say sometimes. And um, I note as well that uh, Mary Susan Barry notes um, that there may be bias in the poll because most individuals attending the event are already interested in data, which is a fair point. Hopefully, if any national newspapers are watching, they won't decide to run a front page story off the back of it. But uh, you never know based on recent events. Anyway, Selvin and Alistair, over to you. Great, thanks, Karen, for that introduction and a warm welcome to everybody on the call tonight. Uh, I'm not part of all of us here at Slalom. Um, my name is Al Vetch. I'm a client service partner with um, Slalom. Um, I've been responsible for the work in Selvin's directorate over the past year or so. Um, I appreciate that for many, Slalom is perhaps not a, a household name. Um, so in a nutshell, we're 11,000 people globally. Um, we're a team of researchers, designers, creatives, engineers, strategists, agile delivery leaders and innovators. Um, and from a data perspective, we get involved with all aspects from data strategy through to data migration, drafting ethics and standards, and everything from sort of visualization through to advanced analytics. And the next one, please, Hannah. I'm delighted tonight that uh, we've got Selvin with us, um, who's our SRO at Bayes, responsible for the multi billion pound local energy policies. And together, we're going to be talking about establishing a culture of real time data led policy and how data can both help to uh, better design and deliver policy. I guess from my perspective as a, as a citizen, what I want from a policy is something that is engaging, strikes a chord, and I guess from those delivering the policy, it has to be something uh, that is going to re result in a behavioural response or a change, particularly in the realms of, sort of local energy, um, how it affects residents. I think the good news from my perspective is that, that we see and have experienced today that the data and technology exists to make this happen. Um, I think the more we experiment and build familiarity with that data will only get to be better. Um, and as we improve access to it and the skills and curiosity we use it appropriately, uh, we'll get more familiar with it. Um, we've used things like the indices of multiple deprivation that covers aspects such as uh, education, attainment, health, crime, income levels. We found a way to fuse that with existing data that the department's held on things like building types, ownership models, efficiency ratings, and so on, as well as some of the supply side aspects about capacity and supply chain um, and some of the measures that we're looking to install through, through the policies. And with this, we've been able to provide quite a sharp focus at both regional, local authority, constituency, and in some cases down to, to kind of postcode level data. I think what we've learned through this process is actually there's probably three things within that modern culture of data that, that we see as important. One of them is around maintaining the investments in the underlying data infrastructure, the tools and the analysis techniques. Another thing is perhaps around rewiring and reimagining the way that the ways of working and our operating model actually functions. And probably most importantly, I think it's probably the, the culture uh, in terms of the, the way that we use the data. Um, and that's incumbent on everybody within the organisation from leaders uh, right the way through. Anyway, that's a bit of a tee up. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass over to Selvin um, and give a little bit more uh, discussion around the advantages that he saw as the SRO in adopting a data led approach. Thank you, Alistair. And thanks to Gavin and IFG for also giving me an opportunity to talk about the exciting programmes that we've been powering through data at, at Bayes. So I'm Selvin Brown, I'm the director for Net Zero Buildings, which accounts for about 30% of the country's uh, uh, Net Zero challenge currently. Um, so a quick recap uh, on what we have done in the last 18 months with Slalom and Alistair. Um, so um, the department had to pull together very quickly um, a number of programmes, four in particular, and uh, we uh, we're able to discharge about 2.5 billion pounds, which is part of a 6.6 .6 billion pound um, commitment this this parliament. 
Um, those programs were put together last summer at record speed. Um, we had to basically stand up data and the dashboards that support uh, the data within days. Uh, we had ministers from all over Whitehall, but in particular in Bayes and Treasury and Cabinet Office, interested in, in, the, in the data that were, relates to these uh, programmes. And we had over 200 unique licensed viewers. Um, ministers were genuinely involved and immersed in the dashboards and the stories that they were telling about Mrs Miggins and her bungalow in Sheffield that was being insulated. Uh, one of the ministers in particular um, self-served. He actually used the dashboards and the Power BI app that relates to it to present to MPs and members of the House of Lords himself directly, which was really genuinely impressive. Uh, ministers could also see the scheme performance, as Alistair said, down to constituency, ward, local authority level, region, sub-regions, and were able to play a part in promoting the schemes of, you know, to get local authorities and others to apply for these, these very important grants. We were able to use transparency and take stakeholders and delivery partners with us. It wasn't all good news. We had to take the data offline at points to dive in and really look at some of the things that weren't working. So for example, where we had very low demand in a particular area or where we had a low supply chain and really try and understand that piece. In one case, we actually worked out very quickly that a simple policy change uh, to enable subcontractors to be appointed uh, uh, to work on the measures that related to the scheme could fix the problem. We did that in a matter of weeks. Normally that would take a post-implementation review to identify the particular problem, and that could take months and sometimes years. So as a, an SRO of these big programmes, this data, the real-time data, has increased our confidence, my confidence, in, in, in being able to take decisions, but importantly also taking with me very important um, stakeholders. Alice has mentioned it, but I'll reiterate, you need to be competent in the tools, the systems, the processes, being able to present the data, and you need to basically build uh, your team around some of these processes and also um, to build their capability, uh, etc. Next slide, please. Just sort of saying a little bit more about the team. So we basically built a central hub in the directorate. We went from four, 200 to over 400 people in a very short period of time. The team is multifunctional or discipline. We cover service delivery, finance, commercial, program management, policy. And um, being able to uh, build the team around the data and the data hub was really, really important to improve our own performance, the performance of the scheme, and also make ourselves very data, what I call data confident, data savvy, and data curious. We had to look at data from the strategic bird's eye and also the wormhole um, granular as well. Uh, we had to focus on the benefits or the outcomes that we were achieving. These were multiple, net zero, reducing fuel poverty, increasing employment during the pandemic, as well as outcomes around building up some of the supply chains. Um, this led to a much more can-do data-led culture, which we're now spreading throughout other parts of Bayes and also beyond the department into um, some of the supply chains, so into the local authority areas with the, uh, relationships with other delivery partners as well. I could go on and you can tell I'm very excited about this development. I'll end with this one piece, which is a cabinet secretary recently made a very important speech about the future of the civil service. And one of the things that he said was, we need to be putting data at the heart of our organization, be data led. That's what I think we've been doing with our data visualization, our insight approach. And we have caught the attention of the Prime Minister's delivery unit in that respect. And we're also working with the Leveling Art Department on this exciting new next chapter. Thank you. Back to you, Alistair. I think we all have some time on, Gavin, but um, we can leave the last slide up maybe just a sort of summary. I think the, the, the main takeaway for me is the fact that actually we can develop these skills pretty quickly. The data and technology exists today. Um, the framework we've got up here is, is the way that we've approached um, developing that capability in, in Selvin team um, and also serves as some of the skills transfer stuff. These capabilities can be put together quickly, cost effectively. As Selvin said, we can deliver visualizations in days and we can deliver policy <coughs> changes in weeks. Thank you.
both very much indeed. Sure. Oh, excellent. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you again very shortly, I think, as those slides come off the screen. Excellent. Um, just a reminder, everyone, you can keep asking your questions via Slido. We've now got eight minutes to question Selvin and Alistair. Um, we've got some great ones coming in already. I'm going to start with a version of one that I think Robert Teal asked um, probably for the last presentation, but I think it's highly relevant here, which is when it comes to data being used in political decision making, to what extent is it the politicians choosing to look for the data and to what extent is it the data being available or not being available that dictates whether it's used? So, so um, I think in some ways um, you have got to um, work out what is the, the leading indicators and therefore the data that you actually need in order to um, basically support ministers. So in, so in my case, uh, there was a lot of information that needed to be provided around the, the spread. There was concern that would have a postcode lottery. Um, uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. We have 100% involvement within one year of all local authorities in, in, in our programmes. Um, there was concern about uh, concentration around um, certain measures being available in some areas and not in others. And, and so that, that was a, another bit of focus. Um, you, 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 you may not know this, but ministers have been going on training with the IPA in, in looking at delivery, and, and some of our ministers have been on this training, so they're increasingly asking the, the leading indicator questions around some of this stuff. And so it's been actually um, very enjoyable and pleasurable to go on with them on that, on that particular journey. Excellent. Um, I think we've got a few other questions coming about ministers, um, but I'm going to go to one from Ruth Dixon next. Even to you, Ruth. Real-time refinement of data is fine, but what value do you see in long-term consistency of data sets? So if I was to talk about the local authority delivery scheme, which um, through which we have disseminated £800 million in the last uh, 15 months, um, what we saw there was a, lo a large number of local authorities who had devolved themselves from stock, uh, who actually thought they knew the stock condition in their local area, but, but turned out that either, in some cases, the stock had already been improved or wasn't fit for purpose for the particular measure that they had assumed that could go in there. So actually, this program has reinvigorated the stock condition survey of stock in local authorities, which has been really, really, really helpful. So I would say uh, the, 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 the data is getting a much better and needed to be. And that's been part of, uh, of the programme. We're, we're working with local authorities, we're working with housing associations on improving their ability to develop uh, the right uh, data to support them on this journey. Excellent, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, on real-time data, which I'll, I'll put together. Anonymous, evening to you, Anonymous, um, asks, can you expand on your definition of real-time data? Is it real-time as with a financial trading platform, or is the data ingested on an hourly, daily basis? And a related question, uh, another Anonymous, or possibly the same Anonymous, what is one decision that was made on the basis of real-time data? So... I mean, I'm a policy maker. Policy doesn't change very often, then it changes very dramatically and, and it could last for another 10, 15 years. It, real time is real time. I mean, we're talking daily, uh, more than daily um, in, in some cases. Um, and that, that, that is kind of unheard of, right? I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been at this for 30 years. It's very unusual for me to be able to pull a lever and get a 403.30 meeting with the minister. What are the numbers for today, okay? Um, I gave you an example, I won't repeat it, of, of a decision um, in relation to supply chain. That subcontractor decision that we took brought in hundreds of subcontractors into the supply chain um, at the flick of a switch. And it, as I say, it would have taken uh, us to do a post-implementation review to have discovered that in, in the old way in which we did things. Uh, we did that literally in a matter of weeks. I mean, on the real time data point, you know, we it's a phrase that we weren't 100 percent happy with at the time, even though we were getting data at different points. The most important aspect of it was it had a certain degree of sort of cachet and it actually promoted a few conversations about what we meant by real time. 
the result was that more people were engaged in the process because they felt they were getting real time. And, and that probably wouldn't have happened had we not used that particular kind of phrase, even though the reality was we were getting data of different latencies you know, throughout the period they've been working. Some of it was hourly, some of it was daily, some of it was weekly and monthly. Excellent. Thanks both. We've got about three minutes left. There's still time for your questions to come in. Um, Professor Stephen John Newton asks, is personal data at a higher risk of misuse these days with the advent of social media? So I suppose that there's a more general question there about to what extent were you using sort of personal and sensitive personal data and how, how would you handle some of that differently? Yeah, so we so we never handle personal data in, in, in the way that I think um, you're, you're inferring. Um, what we did use is things like Google Analytics and some of the um, the feedback from a couple of sources, from the Simple Energy Advice website, but also from uh, conversation directly between one of the delivery partners through a, a contact centre and um, and residents. And we got feedback on you know from the scheme, so we could use that to understand the sentiment levels, and we we had uh, visualisations to describe how that was unfolding throughout the the life cycle of the the schemes. That's very useful to understand and to, want to be able to drill down uh, and be able to use some of that information and data to then maybe craft a slightly different response or to understand some of the nuances that existed regionally and locally as well. We have all the appropriate data handling policies and procedures in place. Mrs. Meggins is not a real character, she's a fictional character to demonstrate to ourselves, to ministers, to all of you that actually we do put customers, users at the heart of what we're doing here. I'm, I'm very good that we've, we're very pleased we've not invaded Mrs. Megan's privacy uh, this evening. Um, so we've got about one and a half to two minutes left. Um, got a couple of, of some great questions uh, left as well. Um, Anonymous asks, is there any funding to support staff to be able to better interpret data? Lots of organisations, particularly local authorities, have a lot of rich data, but the issue is sometimes how to interpret it. Absolutely. We, we have a transformation programme. We're upskilling all of our teams. Actually, we've been recruiting lots of digital natives, lots of young people. I used to work in the government common service and they would come in and they would teach us old folk how to do it. So, so some of our um, younger people don't need uh, much help there. They're, they're able to do it for themselves. But, you know, there is a, a lot of training. But I think there's a point as well about, you know, people um, respond to leadership, you know, because I care about things, I genuinely do, because I'm a geek and I'm focused on it, then people actually are more inclined to um, to, to go with the programme and to, to get involved with the data way in which we're centralising our approaches. Excellent. And we've got about 50 seconds left, so I'm going to squeeze in a final question. Um, Again, from Anonymous, what are you touched on this already? What was the feedback from ministers in terms of having access to this level of data? Were they used to having that type of access during the scheme? Delivery? They were blown away by the uh, quote unquote granularity I was able to show ministers in name a constituency, name a local authority. I'll go there and I'll show you that that constituency has got down to the public sector scheme for schools, this amount of money, down to the local authority lad scheme, this amount of money on the Greenhomes grant, this amount of money. And they could not quite believe that we're able to get to that level of detail. We actually have on one power BI, 2.5 billion pounds by uh, area postcode. Uh, and we hope, I mean, no promises, to make that into an open source product at some point in the in, during the spending review period. Brilliant. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you both very much indeed. Um, very good to hear your presentation and uh, for the answers to all of those questions. Thank you both very much. Thank you. <laughs> that now brings us on to our third speaker of the evening from the NHSX AI Lab. Over to Burmi. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Brimmy Balaram. I'm the head of AI research and ethics in the NHS AI Lab. I'm going to be providing an overview of the ethics initiative today. Um, so just to give you some context, the AI Lab was set up in 2018 um, to enable the development and adoption of safe, ethical and effective AI-driven technologies in the UK health and care system. Um, and we primarily do this through our five delivery programs. So we have the AI Award, we have Skunk Works, which is focused on prototyping, um, we have AI imaging, which is um, at the moment standing up 
a national medical imaging database, um, and we have our regulatory program. And the ethics initiative was launched earlier this year, um, but I think that it's important that we see it as cutting across all of the other programs and influencing the work that we do in terms of improving evaluation, the design and develop, development of technologies, how we implement systems and infrastructure, and how we regulate AI and health and care. So ultimately a big part of our role um, as a program is to drive forward the AI lab's key goal to uh, build trust and confidence in the way that these technologies are deployed uh, in the NHS. Um, this means that ethics cannot be siloed, that we have to find a way of ensuring that ethical approaches are integral to everything that we do um, to facilitate the use of AI here. Um, so this slide sets out what we do as a program. So um, we primarily invest in research and practical interventions that complement and strengthen existing efforts to validate, evaluate, and regulate AI-driven technologies. Um, we encourage proactive approaches to countering inequalities that may arise from the ways that AI is developed and deployed in health and care. And we support projects that are patient-centered, inclusive, and impactful, and which address issues of transparency, safety, privacy, explicability, and uh, fairness. Um, so we were inspired by the philosophy of nothing about us without us, which comes from the disability rights movement and conveys the need to directly involve patients in the public in the process of adopting AI within health and care. So our intention is to be patient centered, inclusive and impactful as we strive to integrate ethics into the AI lifecycle and we will support projects that can demonstrate these values. Um, so we have five pillars in our, our our program is the first is models for improving trust and confidence in AI. These are essentially um, standalone uh, projects that have this common thread around trust and confidence. Um, so the first of these projects is with the uh, Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, so we're specifically partnering with them to design and trial algorithmic, algorithmic impact assessments um, as part of our program on AI imaging. So as a condition of developers or researchers um, seeking access to the data, we're asking that they fill out um, an impact assessment, which will have like a participatory element to it. So we will involve um, patients in the public in um, deciding on or like weighing in on the, the specific use cases that uh, the developers or researchers are asking um, uh, for data for. And uh, we hope that this will support developers auditing their technology at an early stage when there's still greater flexibility to make adjustments and address possible concerns. Um, we also have a project with Health Education England. So this was in response to the TOPL review in 2019. Um, and the idea is that we will want to um, better understand levels of trust and engagement with AI solutions in health and care and what this in turn means for AI enabled patient care. So um, the findings will inform a skills and capabilities framework that HE is currently developing. Um, so for example, this might set out expectations um, in relation to healthcare professionals with respect to um, their role in post-market su surveillance, for example. Um, and we hope that this framework will help healthcare professionals um, feel more empowered to make the most of these uh, technologies in the workplace and to realize the benefits for both patients and, them and themselves. Uh, the second pillar is around our core research commitments. So the main project here is uh, our work with the Health Foundation. So we partnered on a joint research call, and this was in response to concerns about algorithmic bias and in particular the racialized impact of algorithms in health and care. So. Um, while we recognize that uh, bias does not only affect racialized communities, um, there have been examples of deploying AI in the US, which indicate that there is a particular risk of algorithmic bias um, worsening outcomes for minority ethnic patients. And at the same time, there has been limited exploration of whether and how AI can be applied to address racial and ethnic disparities in health and care. So the, the, the focus of this call is um, essentially on accounting for the health needs of diverse communities and how we can leverage um, these technologies to improve health outcomes for minority ethnic populations. So we actually just announced these projects last month. Um, so we've awarded 1.4 million in funding to four projects over the course of the next couple of years. Um, so the first project audited um, is looking at uh, how we can raise the uptake of screening for STIs um, and HIV among minority ethnic communities through an automated AI-driven chatbot, which provides advice about sexually transmitted infections. The research will also inform the development and implementation of chatbots designed for minority ethnic populations in public health more widely and within the NHS. Um, the second project is aiming to uh, use AI to improve the investigation of factors contributing to adverse maternal uh, incidents among mothers from different ethnic groups, but specifically black mothers. Um, 
who tend to have uh, significantly worse outcomes. And this research will provide a way of understanding how a range of causal factors combine, interact, and lead to maternal harm and make it easier to design interventions that are targeted and more effective for these groups. Uh, the third project aims to ensure that AI technologies that detect diabetic retinopathy work for um, different subpopulations. So it will look to validate the performance of AI retinal image analysis systems. And the final project is um, going to be looking at developing an international consensus process um, so that we can have some standards around the data sets underpinning AI systems to ensure that they are diverse, inclusive, um, and can support development of AI systems which work across all demographic groups. So they're looking in part at the generalizability of data sets. And the idea is that this would help um, inform regulators, commissioners, policymakers, and health data institutions um, on whether AI systems are underpinned by data sets which represent everyone and don't risk leaving underrepresented and minority groups behind. Um, our third pillar is communities of practice. So um, we wanted to use the AI virtual hub to bring together grantees, academics, innovators, healthcare practitioners, and civil society groups to learn from one another about how to mitigate and redress racial bias when developing and deploying AI driven technologies. Um, so the idea is that we would prompt researchers to use this forum to disseminate early findings and elicit feedback and support, um, promote insight days for researchers to present and discuss their work in depth, and facilitate collaboration between researchers and innovators or practitioners. Our fourth pillar is a participatory grant making fund. So the idea is that um, we would move to experimenting with a bottom up approach to identifying emerging ethical challenges of importance to the public. Um, and that would help guide our investment. And we would um, use deliberative methods. So drawing on experts to support patients and the public in making decisions about the ethical challenges that they are most concerned with. So we've currently partnered with ScienceWise on this. And <clears throat> our final pillar is support for grantees and internal guidance. So um, we're gonna be setting up a strategic advisory group. And the idea is that um, we could support grantees with maximizing the influence and impact of their work. Um, and also provide the necessary support to colleagues across the lab to ensure that we can integrate relevant relevant findings successfully across the work of uh, the lab from our various projects. So that's everything from me on the AI ethics initiative. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Burmi. A lot of a uh, lot of ground covered there. So hopefully lots of uh, fertile ground for questions. And we've got some coming in already. Uh, you may need to turn your camera back on. Excellent. I think we're going to see you very shortly. Excellent. Um, so um, let's start with a question from Mary Susan Barry. She asks, is there a sufficient understanding of AI and data ethics within central government arm's length bodies and local authorities? Will further challenges similar to the education algorithm fiasco be required before ethics is embedded in services? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I feel like definitely within the regulatory bodies, um, and arms and bodies, there is a, a pretty good understanding of AI. And we actually work really closely with the regulators um, in healthcare. So HRA, MHRA, CQC, NICE, um, their ALBs as well that I mentioned. But um, we have a number of projects with them. Um, so our flagship project is actually looking at developing a multi-agency advice service um, that will kind of streamline processes um, in relation to like navigating the, the very complex fragmented system that currently exists for um, providing regulatory approval to um, to different products. But um, I think in terms of this question of, of will we see a similar fiasco uh, in the healthcare sector, um, I would hope not because healthcare is a very uh, strictly regulated sector in comparison to a lot of other sectors. Um, but then also that is kind of the idea around um, the ethics initiative and specifically this call on health inequalities because we have seen um, what has happened in countries where we don't have a centralized uh, nationalized system and where things are um, fragmented and therefore um, they can be rolled out um, in a uncoordinated way and where there isn't sufficient approval or um, quality assurance. So I'm specifically thinking of this example in the States um, that uh, was uh, reported on by um, 
Zayed Obermeyer and some colleagues. Um, so it was looking at a an algorithm that had been used for um, patient follow up care, and what it um, what they found was that it actually uh, discriminated against black patients. It, it um, disadvantaged them in relation to white patients because of the factors that it took into consideration, um, which included how much um, patients were paying for their care. So uh, it falsely um, like led to or falsely assumed that if patients were paying less for their care, then they didn't require as much follow up. And so <clears throat> because of um, algorithms like that and others, uh, we decided that we needed to take a much more proactive approach. And so um, I think what's what's different about what we're doing is that we're recognizing that historically there have been this is these issues where certain communities have been left behind and we need to actually take, um, yeah, take into consideration how one, we mitigate um, potential issues of bias in a proactive way, but then also think about the, using the power of AI to actually um, apply it to the challenge of addressing gaps in health outcomes. Um, so I think we're we're using AI in a different way than um, they did in the education sector, for example. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Anonymous. Um, are your AI tools based on administrative clinical data? And if so, how do you deal with less equitable access to particular services? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so I, I can't think of a specific project that we are funding as the AI ethics initiative that um, is based on administrative data in particular. Um, but we are we have run into this issue of like underrepresentation in data sets. So actually um, one of our researchers uh, put out a really good paper uh, earlier this, this year that was looking at publicly available data sets for ophthalmology and one of the things that they did point out was that um, <clears throat> that uh, certain countries are like vastly over overrepresented in the data, um, and and therefore like when you are developing algorithms on these publicly available data sets, um, they may not work for um, certain intended populations. And then actually there was another paper that was put out by um, some researchers at the University of Cambridge that was. Um, flagging this idea of like Frankenstein um, publicly available data sets. So basically saying that um, a lot of data sets were being combined and that researchers were unintentionally training um, or unknowingly training their algorithms on um, overlapping data sets. So <laughs> I think that these are issues that we're alive to um, and hopefully Actually, one of the things that I would really like to see out of the um, participatory fund that we're funding is, or that we want to stand up is um, how we can encourage um, patients from minoritized groups or, or, or a wide range of, of um, backgrounds to actually share more of their data because like that, <laughs> that's obviously um, an issue that's come up. Great, thank you. Um, we've got about two and a half minutes left. Uh, so the next question is from Paul. Uh, what evaluation of the impact of AI in improving health outcomes are being undertaken? Um, yeah, so at the moment, uh, we ha have the AI award, um, which is a 140 million investment into um, supporting um, innovators like at all stages of technology development. Um, with uh, going through the regulatory process, but then also from like phase four technologies, which are quite mature, um, we're funding large scale evaluation. So this is like the highest concentration of um, AI evaluations, um, I think it, like, that we've ever had. So that's really exciting. And um, they haven't reported yet on um, any of the outcomes, but that is something that they're currently exploring through um, that program of work. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Matt Sullivan. Are you able to explain what quality assurance measures are put in place to ensure that AI solutions are working correctly and are optimised? Yeah, so the, the main quality <laughs> assurance solution that we have is, is through MHRA, so um, technologies that are being CE marked or CA marked at the moment. Um, 
And <laughs> what uh, we're trying to do in the lab is actually um, like uh, enable validation, external validation of technologies as well. So that's what my colleague in the imaging team is doing. He's standing at the, he's actually stood at the National COVID-19 Chest Imaging Database um, during the pandemic. Um, and at the moment, um, they've just gotten approval to do a benchmarking exercise, which would enable them to then um, be clearer about uh, how others could like validate their um, algorithms against the data that is available as part of NCCID. So that would be another way of providing some quality assurance. Uh, but then I think the other thing that I mentioned with, with the impact assessments that we're doing with data is like, hopefully we would also um, be able to have like quality assurance processes at like different stages of um, the AI life cycle. So not just thinking about when products are at a really advanced stage and they're ready to be a CE or CA marked is, but like also thinking about how we could support um, innovators like at different stages to kind of think through the legal, social, ethical implications of their work um, and make sure that it is robust. Great. Well, I think that brings us perfectly to the end of our eight minutes. Bemi, thank you very much for sharing all those projects with us and uh, we look forward to, to seeing how they all get on. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, that brings us to our final uh, speaker of the evening, uh, and that's Toby. So, Toby, uh, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thanks, Gavin. Hopefully you can see my slides. We can indeed. Uh, yeah, in that case, hi, I'm yep, Toby Jolly. Uh, I work in the Government Grants Management Function in Cabinet Office. I'm just going to talk today about the work we've done on publishing Government Grants data I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by government grants and what we publish and then I'll talk about the issues we had with the publication and how we have addressed those primarily by uh, automating the publication process. So firstly what do I mean by government grants? Uh, government grants are funds intended to be permanently transferred from a government organisation to a grant recipient in order to fill a public or um, a policy need. Unlike Contracts, which focus more on outputs, grants focus on outcomes and impact, which in practice, a lot of grant funds, things like research, international development and charities that are doing work in an area that the government wants to support. Alongside that, grants are used as a big source of funding for publicly funded non-central government orgs, such as schools, police and local authorities. And as you can see here, it's a lot of money. So in 1920, um, the grant mechanism was used to spend £118 billion pounds, uh, by central government um, and there are around 2,000 grant schemes there in a typical year with around 200,000 awards um, to organisations within those grant schemes. Um, so that's what grants are, what they look like. I'm just going to talk about what we publish and why. So each year we publish data on the previous financial year's grant spending. We do this primarily for the purpose of transparency so the public can see what government is doing. Grant data was commitment one of the Open Government uh, Action Plan a few years ago. We've met that commitment and are now continuing to publish this data annually. We now publish the 360 Giving Standard. Uh, 360 Giving actually being one of the people who gave an early data bytes talk about a, an organisation that define a standard for publication for all grant making organisations and then they're able to aggregate that data across the economy so that anyone can see the data that we publish alongside the data from other organisations, including local authorities and large charitable trusts in one place. I've stuck a very simplified example of our data here. So it's in, in its simplest form, we publish this, so this large 200,000 row table that says who gave money um, to who for what reason. Some examples I've picked from the 1920 data here are this DFT grant, which was um, used to uh, uh, uptake the uh, ULA, oh, sorry, to change uh, to, uh, to deliver a step change in the uptake of uh, uh, low emissions vehicles in um, in the West Midlands, and um, this DEFRA grant was about uh, helping the conservation of a tree in southeast a uh, uh, species of tree sorry in uh, southeast Asia. Um, so the, the government actually has actually been publishing this data for several years. Uh, but it's been a little variable year on year. Just to highlight some of the problems with previous publications, uh, prior to last year, the publication didn't meet the code of practice for stats, so we weren't counted as official statistics. We didn't meet the 360 giving standard, as I mentioned earlier, and each publication was inconsistent with the other years, and the 
uh, process itself was very uh, Excel based. I'm going to focus a little bit on that last one for the rest of, uh, rest of this talk um, because it was one of the key changes um, that facilitated the other changes. And that change was uh, the production of a reproducible analytical pipeline. So many people here will be familiar with reproducible analytical pipelines or RAPs, uh, but in summary, they're about automating those parts of the process uh, that can be automated to save time, improve accuracy, consistency, and as you might imagine, reproducibility. But uh, here's the basic idea that what that looks like. So many statistical publications look like the top diagram here, where you take data from a data store, calculate some stats in some software, maybe Excel, stick that in a spreadsheet, produce some graphs and format some tables manually, and then copy and paste that into a Word doc, which you then convert to a PDF, and then stick it on Cuff UK. It's uh, super manual, fairly error prone, takes time. And if you find an issue during that sort of final quality assurance of that final product, you have to go through some significant part of the rest of the process again uh, to produce correct figures at the end. Um, uh, RAP, on the other hand, aims to have the analysis as code, where the manual steps are condensed into this single automated step, which means you extract the data from the analysis and produce the outputs in one click. It does require much more upfront development, but pays off hugely. Uh, the most significant benefit from our perspective was the value of being able to develop the publication alongside the data collection rather than the process being linear and that included the power to see the end products at any stage. Um, just to show you what that looked like from us, we saw our grants data in GGIS, which is this bespoke software that we use to collect data from across government. We extract the data from GGIS run a single Python script and that produces the publishable uh, Excel data file, as well as this GovSpeak version of the accompanying, accompanying statistical bulletin. Um, just to talk briefly about GovSpeak, for those not familiar, uh, GovSpeak is the markup language for gov.uk. So if you want to create a HTML version of a stats document, and you should want to because it's way more accessible, you need to paste this GovSpeak structure into the back end of uh, Whitehall Publisher. Um, which is the back end of gov.uk, shown on the right here. And you don't have to worry about formatting of the PDF or anything, you, because gov.uk does that all for you. It puts the images in the right place, makes all your text and headings consistent. As I said, uh, produces a much more accessible document at the end. So the code behind the grants data publication now does all of this, the most manual step being the copying and pasting of GovSpeak code from the text document that this Python code creates into uh, Whitehall Publisher. Um, so yeah, by doing this, we managed to ensure a bunch of things happened. Um, we could quality assure both the data and analysis throughout the process. So we knew we'd met the code of practice and we could endlessly test the outputs of the code to ensure that it met the 360 giving standard, um, as well as ensuring that the, we had consistent data uh, year on year. So the structure of, those, structure of that data was exactly the same. Um, the time saving was huge, um, especially approaching the publication date. Uh, start, at the start of the year, we published the 19, so the start of this year, sorry, we published the 1920 financial year data, um, which more than tripled the value of the data that we published compared to the previous year. Um, I should also highlight that meeting the code of practice requires a bunch of other things, such as publishing an improvement plan and ensuring that we release the data and stats bulletin on a predefined schedule. Um, so just to summarize a few things to, we took away from the process that other teams across government might find useful. Um, I believe the value in using RAP is well known across government, but I've seen less consideration of this value of producing HTML versions of stats publications and of using RAP to facilitate that. You can write code that almost completely produces these stats documents for you. You'll need to get access to your department's back end of code.uk, but when you do, you'll be able to iterate your outputs extremely quickly and therefore be able to spend much more time ensuring that your publication and data are high quality and fundamentally meet your user needs. So yeah, thank you, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Toby. Um, we've got a question already from Mary Susan Barry, and I had a feeling that this would be an early question uh, to come up, which is, is your wrap available on GitHub and which central uh, bits of government, which, which parts of central government, arms length bodies and local authorities has it been shared with? So uh, the answer is no. To, um, I think the um, yeah, I think it, it would be great if we could if we could share that on on GitHub. We haven't uh, gone through the processes needed to be able to uh, put that into the public domain yet. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with the 
with the ambition to get more um, more code out there so people can um, interrogate it. Great, thank you. Um, Anonymous, who's had a very busy evening again, as ever, um, asks, presumably automating the process will allow you to build on the analysis you do on this data each year. Are there any particular plans for outputs you will look to produce and publish in future? Uh, yes, um, so yeah, that, that is very true. So um, you said a huge, um, a huge burden has been lifted from us in terms of the regular production of, of this publication. Um, and we are going to focus more on the sort of recipient level um, analysis uh, running up to the publication this year. Um, obviously, can't uh, say exactly what that would look like, um, but yeah, we've, yeah, as I said, we've got hundreds of thousands of rows of data, and um, yeah, the actual the variation in the recipients of government grant data is is huge. Got some obviously universities, local authorities, various charities, the police, as I mentioned earlier, um, and yeah, really digging into to what the what the scale of uh, that variation and where those are in the country, for example, is uh, something we're really, really excited about doing this year. Excellent. Um, Sam from Ed Confidential has asked a question that I was going to ask a version of as well, which is what things did you find that you think would be would most help others across government? Um, so I think the, the thing I mentioned around the um, just actually getting access to the the uh, back end of the of White Publisher was really valuable and something that in previous uh, in previous roles I wish I'd known. Um, so definitely uh, uh, definitely do that if you're uh, working across government on stats publications. Um, yeah, I think and I mean maybe start starting early as well with this. Like there's because it's you know it's code and you once you've got it you've got it you can't um, uh, yeah you can't start really too early with the during the statistical development process. Cool. I remember there used to be a, a sort of data publishers community in government to help sort of share some of these lessons. Is there anything like that at the moment that sort of operates across different departments? Um, I'm not linked into uh, community specifically on data publication. I know I've um, talked a lot about this kind of stuff um, with people on like the data science Slack, which is obviously a cross government community um, with a bunch of people working on various different data things, including publications. Um, yeah, that's the main place I've I've talked about this before. Cool. Um, Anonymous uh, says it's great that funding is recorded on 360 giving. How often is this updated and does this detail all government grants? And I suppose there's a there's a wider question um, there as well, which is sort of who else uses this data and how do you work with them? Yeah, so um, it maybe not quite all government grants. I mean, you could look through the specific exclusions in the in the statistical publication. Um, so there's a few that are for various different security reasons and um, the details of them aren't on there um, but we do think it's a it's a vast majority um so yeah that's the that's the first point um our yeah we have had some feedback through our um through our uh, feedback uh, form on the on the website but um yeah 360 giving is our, our primarily our primary sorry our primary uh primary customer and then all our customers um are downstream of them um but yeah we've, we've seen people use it for things like you know and some things in the news going on to the data set and check uh check that some uh org within the news is um got to see what grants they've received in in the past which is obviously the uh, key um key reason we published it so that, that sort of transparent information is out there Excellent, thanks. Uh, Anonymous again asks, have you encountered any challenges or barriers obtaining the raw data? Um, yes, we have like a re relatively straightforward process with this now. Um, uh, so governments, uh, sorry, government departments um, will like vary in the degree to which they're able to get this data to as quickly and vary hugely in the, um, the scale of the grant that they've got so department of education is something like half the half the data is is just a, is grants going to schools um so the yeah the scale of the challenge across government is is huge but i think the um the main the main jump forward that we've made here is the gdis system that i sort of mentioned briefly there which is this uh as i said this bespoke software that um has uh yeah resolved a lot of the challenges by just making the this central database that is uh, relatively user friendly for people to upload data to across government. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the 
main challenges going forward are just about um, yeah, embedding the use of that tool. Excellent, thanks. And um, we've got about two and a half minutes left. There's still time for your questions if you want to send them in via Slido. Um, we've got another question from Ruth Dixon. You mentioned that grants focus on outcomes. Are there plans to evaluate and publish the outcomes of grants awarded? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, I mean, the short answer is like in the short term, no. Um, uh, but yeah, I think uh, getting better outcomes data on grants uh, would be hugely valuable. I mean, there's, a, there's sort of a, a question there about exactly how we would specify that because obviously we're a central a central hub for this data and it's going to be hugely variable what that means for different departments. Um, so I think, yeah, trying to um, find some way of specifying in a data standard what exactly that looks like um, might be a challenge, but um, yeah, I think getting better outcomes data um, would be it would be really, really powerful um, both for publication and just for the and um, functioning of government, obviously. Excellent, thanks. I think w when we think about these sorts of data sets, especially when it comes to sort of government spending, and um, people often think of them through a sort of transparency lens. Is there a sort of government effectiveness angle to all of this as well, in terms of getting that data pipeline running more effectively? Yeah, so um, I mean, a lot of what we do uh, the rest of the year, and we're not doing publication, is around um, helping the rest of the government uh, spend grant money more effectively and this data feeds directly into that. Um, so, I mean, often it's the scheme level information that um, is particularly particularly useful. So that's like the wider project level information about grants, because that informs a lot of the, so the grant manager function where um, my team sit, uh, form, informs a lot of the, the wider functions work in terms of actually supporting the sort of schemes that are the sort of highest risk or most in need of assistance. Um, with, the, with developing their scheme or delivering delivering those grants. Thanks. And in the final 30 seconds, a final question from Mary Susan Barry. Will your database be incorporated or merged into the new integrated uh, data platforms and products, which have been highlighted recently by the Central da Digital and Data Office and the Office for National Statistics? Um, I mean, so we haven't got any uh, active plans to do that, but I'm, I'm depending on the scope of that product. I think I'd be um, I would I would personally welcome uh, getting getting our data to a place where we can share it more widely, um, which is my understanding of what that that would allow. Um, yeah, obviously we haven't we haven't had any direct engagement with the team yet, but yeah, super keen. Excellent. Well, fantastic to learn about all of that work, Toby. Thank you very much indeed for sharing it with us. Thank you. Now, before I get into the parish notices, um, we're going to put a second polling question up quickly for all of you. And that second polling question, which you should be able to access on Slido, is having heard from our speakers tonight, do you feel there is a clearer path for your organisation to be data led? Yes, no or maybe? And hopefully we'll see more yeses uh, than we did with the question at the beginning. So vote now uh, on the second Slido poll that should be appearing any moment. So in terms of those parish notices, um, as I said, we'll be back for Data Bytes 25, the start of our new eight event cycle on the 1st of December and the final presentation that evening uh, will be our 100th ever presentation so do join us for that the last one of the year. Um, as I mentioned during my introduction there's lots of uh, good new work on the Institute for Government website including around performance tracker net zero and analysis of the budget so do check all of that out and there's a lot more coming up at the Institute as well. Tomorrow uh, the Institute is holding a full day conference on ethical standards in government. I'm sure that's some Something that will be of interest to many of you, even if it's something our government apparently no longer cares about. Uh, Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands, will also be in conversation with the IFG in a couple of weeks' time. And before I go to the sort of final uh, parts of that, I'm going to see if we've got any votes coming in on our final poll. So people are still voting. It's a slightly smaller uh, set of respondents so far. But um, having heard from our speakers tonight, do you feel there is a clearer path for your organisation to be data led? I thought this might happen. Yes, say 36%, no, say 43%, and maybe say 21%. Well, hopefully you'll be able to watch all of those presentations back and uh, glean even more from them. All that remains for me to say is um, three big thank yous. First of all, to all of you for coming along tonight and asking some brilliant questions of our speakers. 
to Slalom for supporting tonight's event. We're extremely grateful. It allows us to continue the series. And please do join me in a virtual round of applause for all five of our fantastic speakers this evening. Uh, and if you can, do come along to our virtual drinks, uh, the details of which are hopefully up on screen. So thank you very much again, and hopefully see you at drinks or in December. Good night. <laughs>